Hey everybody, in part one of this video series I showed the basics of using Python with grease pencil objects. In this video we'll be building on those concepts to create points, lines, and other simple shapes, as well as look at various ways of generating noise. As before, we'll set up Blender for scripting. Launch Blender in 2D animation mode. Split the view. Set the right viewport to text editor. Create a new text file. And toggle on the console window. Now we're ready to start typing our code. In the last tutorial, we created our grease pencil objects from scratch with Python. So this time, let's try a different approach and use Python to edit an existing grease pencil object in our scene. Since the default scene already has a grease pencil object in it, we'll try editing that object first. As per usual, we'll import the BPY library. To get the currently selected object, we query the context.selectedObjects. We'll be a little lazy here and assume we've only got one object selected, which is the first object in the list at index 0. We will, however, do a couple of basic checks. We'll make sure that we have at least one object selected, and we'll make sure that the object is of the right type. The object we have selected is the top level of that object's hierarchy. That is, it's the part of the object where we might set transforms or other higher level operations. In order to access the grease pencil data, we need to go down one level to the object's data attribute. From here, we can continue to tunnel down through the API's grease pencil hierarchy to get our layers, frames, strokes, and points. For our layer, Blender's default grease pencil object already contains two layers, so rather than add a new one, let's just use the existing layer by querying the active layer attribute. The active layer is the layer that's selected in either the strokes layer section or in the outliner. Accessing the layer's frames can require a little bit of mental gymnastics. To get an existing frame, we specify an index on the layer's frame attribute. One thing to note is that the index number and the frame number are independent of one another. For example, in this case, there's a keyframe on frame 1. However, we use an index of 0 because it's the first keyframe in the list of frames, and Python lists start indexing at 0. If we want to generate new strokes each time we run the script, we'll need a way to clear out any old strokes. The default grease pencil object doesn't have any strokes on it, so I'll draw one with a mouse so we have something to work with. To clear up any existing strokes, we can call the clear method on the frame. Now we're ready to start adding new stroke and point data. With our layer and frame in place, adding a new stroke works exactly as shown in the last video. We create the stroke by using the new method on the frame stroke attribute. Previously I told you that adding a point was a two-step process. First you add the number of points you want, and then you set the point's position. But this isn't entirely true. If we add a single point to our stroke without the position, we get a point at the origin. Since there's only one point in the stroke, the stroke's line width attribute effectively sets the size of the point. You can also adjust the point size using the pressure attribute, which you might recall acts like a scale multiplier for each point. If you want to have multiple individual points, each point must be associated with its own stroke. This is because Blender connects all the points in the same stroke with a line. By assigning one point per stroke, each point remains its own entity. Here we iterate through each point and use the iterator to drive the point's X position and pressure to get a line of points that increase in size. From there we can play with the values until we get something useful. There are many ways to add noise to your shapes. To start with, we'll use Python's random library to make things more interesting. The first thing we'll do is use the randRange function to generate the number of points. This function generates a pseudo-random integer between the first and second number you specify. Likewise, we'll use the rand range to control the pressure of each point. For the X position, using rand range would produce integers, which is a bit too large for our needs. So instead, we'll use the random function. This function generates a random float value between 0 and 1. We'll also use the random function for the Z position so that our points scatter in all directions. From there we can tweak the settings until things fall into a useful range of values. The 0 to 1 range of the random function is the perfect thing for setting each point's vertex color attributes since they use that range anyways. By using the random function on each of the R, G, B, and alpha channels we can produce random colors in our points. 
Likewise, we can use random on each point strength attribute to randomize the point's opacity. The way we're currently using the random library, the library generates different random numbers each time we run the script. There will be times, however, where you want a random number, but you want the same random number each time you run the script. In other words, a repeatable random number. To do this, we can use the random seed function. To use this function, we pass an integer as a seed value. Which number you use is not important. It's simply specifying a starting point for the random number generation. To see this in action in our current script, however, we need to remove the randomization from driving the number of points. If you want to change the random numbers, just change the seed value until you're happy with how things look. The pattern will always be generated the same way every time the code is run. To disable the repeatability of the randomness, we can simply comment out the seed line and it will return to being completely random again. Before we look at other types of noise, let's take a look at building lines. If you've been following along, building a line should seem fairly straightforward. We'll go back and pare our code down so that we're generating two points on the same stroke and go from there. By adding two points to the stroke, we should theoretically be able to draw a line. But without defining the two points' positions, they're all drawn at the origin. If we specify just the position of the first point, we get a line. Notice that if we only define the position of the first point, a line is drawn, but the second point is drawn at the origin. By setting the position of the second point, we can place it where we want. When we were making points, the line width and pressure attributes were effectively the same thing. But when drawing lines, the pressure allows you to control the width of the line at each point, and Blender interpolates the values between them smoothly. To make things a little easier to manage, let's break out our code for generating a line into its own function. To start with, we'll pass in our frame object and a tuple for both the start and end position. Then we'll add a call to our new function in the main body of the code. This will make it easier to play with the values and give us a good foundation to build in more functionality down the line. Generating lines with two points is only of limited value. If we want to build any variability into our lines, we'll need more points. So let's modify our function to do this. First, we'll add a parameter so that we can specify the number of points we want in the line. We'll then use that parameter to drive the number of points we add to the stroke. Next, in order to interpolate the position of each point in our line, we need to break out the x and z values for both the start and end of our line. To interpolate the x and z, we compute a step value between each point by finding the difference between the end and start positions and dividing that by the total number of points. To apply the interpolation of each point, we then iterate through the points and add an offset value based on the step value and the current iteration for both the x and z positions. If we set it up right, the result should look the same as before. To help see things better, let's add some variation to the points. We'll use the modulus and iterator to set the pressure on every other point to generate a wavy line. With more points, we can now have variation in our line no matter where the endpoints lie. Now that we've tested our function, we'll clean it up by adding a return value and clearing out the noise generation part of the code. Let's try adding some randomness to the line's height. As before, we'll use the random library. To get a random range of both positive and negative numbers, we could use the rand range function again, but the values will be too large since it only produces integers. So instead, we'll use the uniform method, which does the same thing, but can produce a float value in the range we specify. To make things a little more interesting, we can also use a random value to set each point's pressure attribute. Again, we can add randomness to the vertex color to set that in our line. Generating noise purely by chance is one way to do it, but one could argue that it feels a bit too random. So let's upgrade our noise. 
Perhaps a better way to approach this would be to base our noise on the previous point's position. As we iterate through the points, we'll generate a random float with the uniform function, and then add it to the z value from the previous point. Since the first point doesn't have a previous point to reference, we'll add some logic so that it doesn't do anything on the first point except add noise to its current position. At the end of our loop, we'll update the last position with our current position. By using this technique and changing the code up a bit, we can have our line wander in any direction. First, we'll add the ability to create noise for both the x and z axes. Ideally, we'd be able to simply add the first tuple with the original position to the tuple with the noise value to save some space. But adding two tuples together in Python simply concatenates them. What we want is to add each item in one tuple to the corresponding item in the other tuple. To do this, we can import the vector class from the math utils library. Defining each position tuple as an instance of the vector class allows us to combine their values with regular math expressions. With our new code in place, our line now runs randomly in all directions. We can keep noodling the values until we're happy. Another way of generating noise on your line is to use Blender's built-in noise modifier, so it's worth taking a look at that too. Plus it'll give us an opportunity to see how to add modifiers to our objects using Python. To add the modifier to our object with code, we'll use the Grease Pencil Modifier's new function, specify the name noise, and then the type, in this case GP noise. It's worth noting a couple of things here. First, we're adding the modifier to the selected object which is at the very top of our object hierarchy, and not the Grease Pencil data object. Secondly, we use the Grease Pencil modifiers attribute and not the regular modifiers attribute, since Grease Pencil objects have their own set of modifiers. Once we have our modifiers, it's fairly easy to access the various attributes to change their settings. If you want to see what a specific setting is called in the API, you can split your view and change one of them into an info view. This spits out the Python commands Blender is using in real time, so you can simply mess with a value and see which attribute is being changed. We now have a few more tools in our toolbox that we can use to make shapes, but it's still a bit limited. In the next video, we'll look at how to create circles which will vastly expand our capabilities. Thanks for watching.